I don't know about you, but I am convinced there is way too much bad news in our world, and there's not near enough good news in our world. Do you agree? There's just not enough good news in our world. That being the case, and since we agree that there's more bad news than there is good news, and we need more good news, why is it that we don't talk more about evangelism? Well, you say, well, wait, 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 wait a second. You know, evangelism is, is that, that messy word that, that, you know, people that know the Bible do, and they have to, you know, answer a lot of hard questions, and they have to do this and that, and, and, and it kind of gets us in these tight, uncomfortable situations. Uh, you know, you're, you're not talking about good news. You're talking about, you know, nervousness and anxiety when you talk about evangelism, right? No. The world needs more good news and that's where evangelism comes into this conversation. For you see, the word evangelism comes from a Greek word which simply means to proclaim the good news, to share the good news. That's what evangelism is. And so we shouldn't be scared of the idea of evangelism because you already admitted this world is full of bad news and it needs a lot more good news. And when therefore we become evangelist we will say things that are good we will proclaim the good news one of the seven that was chosen there in Acts chapter 6 of the special servants was named Philip and over in Acts chapter 21 and verse 8 he is actually called Philip the evangelist you might recall that when Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5 he said be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. So here's that word. It's the one that comes from evangelism, and sometimes preachers like to be called, prefer to be called evangelist, because it just means that we are those who proclaim good news. All preachers really are evangelists and I'm sure you don't disagree at all with that but here's the catch here's where you come in when you really look at the term evangelist in its wider and really it's its most literal meaning it doesn't refer to me it refers to all of us it refers to every one of us for you see every Christian is supposed to be an evangelist every Christian is supposed to be someone who goes out and shares the good news how do we know that? Well, that's what Jesus said. And so we have those accounts uh, that we call the Great Commission, like in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, or Mark 16, 15, and 16. And, and when Jesus basically says that we, could, we should go and preach the gospel, what he's saying is go be an evangelist. Go share the good news with other people. Well, the reason I brought this up tonight is because I want you to go with me to John, the fourth chapter. And tonight, I want us to... Um, look at the greatest evangelist of all time. He really was the epitome of the message because he was the message. John 1, Jesus was the Word. And so when Jesus came in flesh, John 1 and verse 14, Jesus came bearing the good news. He came representing the good news. If you ever want to, to study and be inspired by the greatest evangelist of all time, it's Jesus, of course because he, he always did this the right way. He had the perfect balance in uh, sharing the gospel with people and, and doing it in the, the best way possible. And so what we find actually in John the fourth chapter is, is really a, a great example of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, in John 4, we really have a case study for evangelism. So if you're interested in sharing the good news, if you're interested in bearing the good news, and, and really fulfilling your call in ministry and being an evangelist, this ought to interest you. And what you find here in John chapter 4, and I hope you have your Bibles and you're going to go ahead and open up to there, you'll find several tips about being an evangelist. The, this lesson is really looking at Jesus and, and learning tips from the greatest Evangelist. So that's what I want us to do. Open up to John, the fourth chapter. And I want us just to kind of dive in and, and put this in our 21st century context. Okay? So here's the first thing I notice. If you're looking for a tip as an evangelist, the first thing I notice, and again, this is 21st century terminology, but if you want to be a great evangelist, 
it requires getting out of the church building okay now now let's look at verses um, three through six uh, so that's kind of when the story story begins here uh, it says he left judea and departed again to galilee I would remind you that Judea is in the southernmost part of the land of Palestine, and Galilee is in the northernmost part. But remember what territory was in between? Samaria. And so no wonder it says in verse 4 there, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now you might say, well, yeah, if, if, if Samaria's in between, you've got to go through that, right? Well, not necessarily, because the Jews had a way to get around this, because Jews didn't like Samaritans, remember? They didn't like Samaritans at all. And so what they would sometimes be willing to do, they'd be willing to walk a long way out of the way to avoid going through Samaria. And what they would end up doing is they would walk uh, due east thereabouts, and they would go across the Jordan River, and they would walk up the east side of the Jordan River and just avoid going through Samaria altogether, and then they would cross back over going west uh, across the Jordan into Galilee. That was the normal route for Jews to go from Judea uh, to, uh, rather from, uh, yeah, from Judea up to, uh, to, to Galilee. They would just avoid altogether going through Samaria. So when it says he had a need or he must needs go through Samaria, it's because he chose to go through Samaria. He made the, he made the choice to go through this area that most Jews in those days would just avoid. Well, here's what I'm trying to say when I say if we're going to learn this tip from the greatest evangelist, we've got to get out of the church building. Jerusalem in Judea, you know, was the epicenter of religion for the Jews. It's, it, you probably could compare it to our church building today. It, now, I know they had synagogues in those days, but Jerusalem was the center of, uh, of, of that worship in those days just kind of like we center so much of our activities, especially our gatherings in the church building. But, but Jesus understood this principle. He needed to get out of Ju Judea. He needed to get out of Jerusalem. He needed to go other places. And, and while a lot of his ministry was right there around Judea and then also up in Galilee, at times he had to venture into Samaria. And that is what he does on this occasion. He knew that he had to get away from the center of religion, and he had to go out and he had to meet people. And so that's why I say, if we want to learn a, a lesson from Jesus, it, the lesson is this. We have to leave this place and go meet other people where they are. You see, if people aren't coming to Christ, it, it means we aren't going to people. People don't come to Christ unless we go to them. It's been said, we can't be fishers of men by fishing in a barrel. If the fish won't come to the barrel, and most of the time fish don't come to the barrel, uh, we have to go where the fish are. And so we have to remember the, the seed principle. The seed principle of evangelism is you have to get the seed to the good ground. And there's this verse in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 19, which asks, is the seed still in the barn? And we have to remember that if the seed is still in the barn, if the seed is still at the church building, or if the seed is still in us and it's not being shared with those out there in the world where the good ground is there is good ground out there then the seed is still in the barn and so i think we've got to overcome this fear and this com confusion that we sometimes have and that is we 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 sometimes confuse being different with distance from the world you probably grew up and were told you've got to be different from the world if you're going to be a christian you've got to be different than the world but somehow or another we equate that with being distant from the world there's a big difference we've never been called to be distant from the world we've just been called to be different from the world jesus said i do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one so we we as as god's disciples we operate in the world listen to what paul said about this first corinthians 5 in verse 11 he said i wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people Yet, I, I certainly did not mean, he says in verse 10, with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since you would need to go out of the world. He says, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother 
who is sexually immoral or covetous or idolater or reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not to even eat with such a person. The point of what Jesus is saying there is, I'm not saying don't associate or don't get close to people who are you know, committing these types of sins, who are sexually immoral or who are covetous or extortioners or idolaters. He says, th- th- those are the people in the world and you've, you- you've got to make contact with those people. That's the whole idea of evangelism is making contact with those people. What, what does it require? It requires getting out of the church building. That's the first great tip that we learn from Jesus, the great evangelist here in John chapter 4. Here's another great tip we, look, we can learn. Look at verses 7 and 8, and that is to build a bridge. Learn to build a bridge like Jesus. Uh, so it, it says here, um, if we'll just pick up where we left off, where it says he needed to go through Samaria. Look at, look at verse 5, and we're going to read down through verse uh, 8, I guess. It says, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, so about midday. And and the woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Building a bridge is about finding common interests with someone. And so I'll ask, what common interest did Jesus have with this Samaritan woman? Everybody gets thirsty. That was the common interest. Everybody gets thirsty. She came to draw water because she would eventually need to have that water for her family. And Jesus, on this journey, he got thirsty. That was the common interest. So, So here's the deal. Before meaningful conversation can occur... Common interest needs to be found. I couldn't help but think this morning when David was talking about going ice fishing. That's just not an excuse for the preacher to get out of the office. Not at all. He's he's found common interest with someone who needs to learn the gospel. And and that's a beautiful example of of building a bridge. Go fishing with someone. You know, we... We all have a need to recreate at times. Everybody has a need to eat. Go, go eat with someone. Find a common interest that you and, and the one you want to share the good news with has and spend time, and then that builds the bridge to something greater, uh, and that is in sharing the good news with them. Here's a third tip we can learn from Jesus here. Uh, draw people in with your actions. Look at verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you... Being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Everybody gets thirsty. That's the common ground. But what happens next actually shocked this lady because this was a man speaking to a woman. And even beyond that, this was a, a Jewish man speaking to a Samaritan woman. And things like that just did not happen in those days. And so this was Jesus drawing this lady in with his actions. You may say, how is that possible for us to show that we're different to people today by, by our, our very actions? Well, just like Jesus, being kind and compassionate to people that don't expect it. Being kind and compassionate to people who aren't expecting it. Uh, by, by not being racially or socially prejudiced. You know, th- this was a, 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 a racially prejudiced situation that, that most Jews would have just been guilty of, and Jesus overcame that. He treated this woman like she deserved to be treated. She was a soul that needed to, to hear the good news. And even by being gracious to sinners. Sinners sometimes are shy when they learn that people are Christians because they expect, the first thing they expect is condemnation from us. And that should not be the case. That should not be the first reaction of a Christian to a non-Christian is condemnation. So be gracious to sinners. It's been said, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. So what I'm talking about here is, is showing people that there's something different about you. Draw people in with your actions the way Jesus drew this woman in with the, the, the action of, of having a conversation with her. And she noted how different that was. I saw this um, report on the news a few days ago, and it reminded me of this. 
Uh, Eunice Shriver was the sister of John F. Kennedy, the president John F. Kennedy. Um, According to her daughter, Maria Shriver, one thing she never heard her mom say was, I love you. She said she was not this typical nurturing, soft-hearted woman. And, and she said, I never heard her tell me, I love you. And you may think, well, that must mean that she was this cold, heartless mother, not in touch with her motherly instinct, but none of her children would say that. They, they said she had a different way about her. But this news report, though, was about something I didn't even understand. I didn't even know. But Maria Shriver, or rather Eunice Shriver, uh, back before it was popular to do so, back before the days of civil rights, and back before the days of, of re- really being kind and reaching out to those who are uh, mentally and physically handicapped, she was doing that. She was in her own community. She was inviting people to their home who um, were different from her, different color skin of her, or especially these, these children who were mentally and physically handicapped. And she was working with them, and she would have camps for them. And, and what basically ended up happening is it was through her efforts that uh, eventually the Special Olympics was f- founded. Through her efforts. And I thought to myself, you know, here's a person who, who wouldn't even tell her child, I love you, but through her actions, she said to others, you're special. And, and so it's through her actions that she preached a, a lesson, if you will. And that's what I'm saying. Preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Draw people in with your actions. Here's another tip, and that is don't go too fast. Don't go too fast. Okay, so let's, let's read some more of the story here, picking up about verse number 10. It says that Jesus answered her and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give to him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give to him will become in him a fountain of living water, or or rather of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, now notice especially these last two verses, verses 15 and 16. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Verse 16, Jesus said, Go call your husband and come here. Some people say, you know, that just doesn't even go together. The whole idea was for Jesus to, to get this Samaritan woman to say, I want the living water. Give me the living water. And as soon as she said, give me the living water, he said, go call your husband and come back. Well, I think what Jesus was really doing here is he was was slowing down the conversation. He was not going too fast. You see, one of the, the great temptations in being a good news sharer is sometimes we want to go too fast. We want to get there. We want to eventually tell them what what, what they ultimately may need to do to know the good news and to experience the, the joy of the good news, forgiveness of sins and gospel obedience. And this woman wanted to jump straight to the blessing of living water, but Jesus understood this. He understood that there were some prior steps that she needed to go through before she could obtain that living water. She needed faith in Him as a Messiah. She needed to get past this idea of him being a prophet. She needed to understand he's uh, the Messiah. Uh, That meant he needed to provide evidence that he was the Messiah. And that was the idea of calling her husband. He was about to prove something to her. So instead of giving her the living water, he tells her to get her husband, which will result in her conviction of him as a prophet. So we've got to be aware of this if, if we're an evangelist and you know if you're uh, trying to share the good news with someone and, and you're talking about the gospel sometimes people want to say well what about revelation let's talk about revelation and you know that might be a time when you say well let's let's don't go too fast we can talk about revelation later but let, let's talk about some things before we get to revelation or 
Some people, you know, want to talk about, well, let's talk about church organization or let's talk about uh, worship. Um, but really, the first things that we ought to talk about are first things, first principles, gospel-oriented things. And we'll get to those things later. So I think it's important that we don't choke a person to death with too, too much information. And I think that's what Jesus was doing. He was pulling back the reins here. He says, let's don't go too fast with this. Here's another tip. Don't jump to conclusions. Look at verses 17 and 18. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, well, you have well said, you have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. I think it's significant here that Jesus didn't march straight into a condemnation of this woman and her sin from the get-go. You know, he could have walked up to the, the well when she walked up. She, she could have walked up and he could have said, Sinner! And he's probably right. But that's not how he started the conversation. He really allowed it, the idea of her sin, to come up more naturally as he talked with her about her life. And again, you know, this was part of the tactic of, you know, she's about to understand he's different. He knows something about me that no one else could know. He remembered his real purpose was to speak words of life to her, not words of death. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he's called us to do the same thing. He's called us to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. And so doing this job means that we don't ignore the reality of sin in someone's life, but that may not be the first thing we talk to them about and, and sharing the good news with them. God's d desire is for them to experience salvation. That means they need to repent of sin, but they need to understand the possibilities of the salvation. And so first things first, don't go too fast. Don't jump to conclusions. Um, and then here's something else. Keep focused on the central issue. We're probably more familiar with verses 19 through 24 in this passage than any other verses. Because, uh, because all of a sudden, uh, as this starts getting personal to this lady, uh, she, she wants to change the subject. And so she wants to start talking about worship. And I think it's noteworthy that Jesus said, okay, well, we'll talk about your question here. Because he knew it was important too. And, and th these are some everlasting principles we find about worship right here. But I want you to see, and we know this verse so well, if you turn on to verse 24, he eventually got it back to what it needed to be about, and that is truth. God is the Spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he brings it back, and, and everything he said was truth there, but he brings it back to the central issue. We've got to talk about the truth. And then here's the last, the last thing. If you want to be an evangelist like Jesus, let them see Jesus. Look at verses 25 and 26. After all of this conversation, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Notice what Jesus said, verse 26. I who speak to you am he. That's the pivotal thing in telling the good news to someone is let them see Jesus. I mean, in this case, Jesus said, here I am, see me. What we do is we point people to Jesus. Maybe that you're here tonight and no one's ever pointed you to Jesus. And we want to point you to Jesus tonight. We want you to know that Jesus is the answer. We want you to know that Jesus came into this world to save sinners we said last week in our lesson from john 1 that the purpose of john's gospel is to cause belief in all men and so everything that's written in john is to cause us to believe that jesus is the son of god and that believing in him we might have life eternal through his name and so if that sounds attractive to you tonight we want to we want you to see jesus we want you to respond to jesus if you know what you need to do to do that to respond to jesus uh, you're welcome to come as we stand and sing this song if not we can study more about that you're welcome to come to Jesus right now as we stand and as we sing.